Hello, welcome to the course SJPHY3BO3 Electrodynamics 1. The contents of this course is taken from Introduction to Electrodynamics by David J. Griffiths. Today we will start Module 4 which is Chapter 5 Magnetostatics from Griffiths. I'm sure all of you are thorough with the concepts of electrostatics. So there we had a collection of charges. This could be either discrete charges or a continuous charge distribution. Call it as a source charge. Then we are interested in finding out what is the force exerted by these source charges on a test charge, capital Q. Now the test charge is at a distance R from the source charges and the test charges could be either stationary or moving but importantly the source charge is always at rest. So when you have stationary source charges the only force acting on the test charge is an electrostatic force. We have derived an expression for that. And if you take the magnitude of the test charge to be unity, then the force per unit charge, that is known as the field associated with these source charges. So in electrostatics, the source charge is always at rest. Now the important question is, what happens when the source charge is moving? Do the field, does the field remain the same or does it change? That's the question we need to answer. I can illustrate this using a simple experiment. So take two parallel wires, keep them close to each other and pass current through both the wires. And you will find that when the direction of the current is same in both the wires, they are attracted to each other. On the other hand, when the directions are opposite, they are rippled away. Let's try to understand what's happening here. First, let's look at the repulsion case. This is uh, pretty straightforward. We know that similar electrons are traveling through both the wires. Since like charges ripple each other, both the wires are rippled away. Nothing unusual here. But in the second case, when the direction of current is same, both are attracted. Two electrons can never attract each other. So what's happening here? If you assume that only electric field is associated with a charge, then this is difficult to comprehend. So which means there is something other than electric field is coming into action here. What's that? By chance, if you take a magnetometer or a compass close to this current carrying wire, you will find that the needle of the compass is rotating, indicating the presence of a magnetic field. So this is the major difference between a stationary charge and a moving charge. For a stationary charge, only an electric field or an electrostatic field is associated with it. In the case of moving charge, in addition to the electric field, a magnetic field is also coming into picture. Now, as I said, the needle of the magnetometer rotates, indicating that the direction of the magnetic field is circumferential. Now, to find out the direction of magnetic field, you can use the right hand thumb rule. Imagine you have a current carrying wire. Place the wire in your right hand with your thumb pointing along the direction of the current. Then the direction in which your fingers curl around the wire, this gives the direction of the magnetic field. So here current is linear and the magnetic field is circumferential. So if current is flowing in the upward direction, the direction of magnetic field is counterclockwise. If the current is flowing down, then you have a clockwise flow uh, movement of magnetic field. Now, in electrostatics, we have seen that a charge Q placed in an electric field E experience, experiences an electrostatic force QE. Similarly, what is the force experienced by a charge in a magnetostatic field? So imagine that you have charge capital Q moving with velocity in a uniform magnetic field B 
Then the magnetic force or magnetostatic force experienced by the charge is given by Q into V cross B. This is known as Lorentz force. So remember, this is a cross product, meaning it's, it is perpendicular to both velocity and the magnetic field. So if you take this as the direction of the magnetic field, and the upward direction is the direction of current or velocity, then how do you find out the cross product? Place your right hand along the direction of V and curl it towards B, then the direction of your thumb, which is this direction, gives you the direction of the magnetic force. So now you have two types of forces, a field associated with the electric field and the field associated with the magnetic field. So if you have both the fields present, the total force experienced by the charge is a sum of electric force plus magnetic force. So you can write the net force as Q into E plus V cross B. So this is known as the Lorentz force law. Once we identify the magnetic force, next question is what is the work done by the force? Right? This is the natural question. So imagine that the charge Q moves a distance dl. Since we already know the velocity of the charge, you can write distance as velocity into time. So dl is V into dt. The infinitesimal uh, amount of work done by the magnetic field during this displacement can be written as dW magnetic equal to F magnetic dot displacement dl. Substitute for F magnetic Q into V cross B dot V dt. Remember, this is a cross product, meaning this is going to be perpendicular to the velocity. And you are going to take a dot product of that with the velocity. So we know dot product of two perpendicular vectors is zero. So consequently, work done equal to zero. So this is a very, very important result. Magnetic force does no work. In other words, Magnetic force cannot accelerate or decelerate a charged particle. Only thing it can do is to alter the direction of motion of the particle. Now, how does the magnetic field influence the direction of motion? Let's try to understand that in more details. Uh, we will see two particular examples. One is a, a classic example of motion of charged particle in a magnetic field, cyclotron motion. Second one is a cycloid motion. So in cyclotron motion, I have charge Q moving with a constant velocity V perpendicular to a uniform magnetic field. So V is perpendicular to the magnetic field. So let's take an example configuration here. I have some area consisting of a uniform field uh, magnetic field B, look at the direction of the magnetic field, it is pointing into the page. I hope you are familiar with this convention. Assume that you have an arrow and the arrow is going into the plane of the screen, then you will be seeing only the tail of the arrow indicated by this cross. On the other hand, if the magnetic field or the arrow is coming out, then you will be seeing only the head of the arrow, which will be indicated by a dot. So here magnetic field is going into the plane. And charge Q is moving with velocity V in the upward direction. So V is perpendicular to B. And from the Lorentz force, we know that the particle is going to experience a magnetic force Q into V cross B. If you look at the direction, this is the direction of the magnetic force. So at every point, the charge is going to experience an inward force as a consequence of that, it is going to move in a circle. This is similar to uh, rotation of a stone, which is tied to a string. We have seen that example in our classical mechanics course. So here, uh, the charge executes a circular motion where a centripetal acceleration required for the circular motion is provided by the Lorentz force or the magnetic force. So centripetal uh, force is given by m into v square by r, where r is the radius of the circular part. And what is the magnetic force? Q into v cross b. Since v and b are perpendicular, 
the cross product is replaced by a normal product. You can write QVB equal to MV squared by R. So you can cancel V on either side, then you get momentum P equal to MV, which is Q into B into R. This is known as cyclotron formula. This is a very, very important uh, result. We will, uh, we will discuss a couple of applications of this formula in the next slide. So before that, we have a circular motion. We can find out the period of circular motion. So time period T is given by the distance traveled in one cycle, which will be the circumference of this circle 2 pi r divided by velocity v. From the cyclotron formula, I can write r equal to mv divided by qb. So substitute for r in this equation, you have 2 pi mv divided by qb v. Cancel v on both numerator and denominator, you get t equal to 2 pi m divided by qb. Once you get time period, you can quickly calculate frequency, which is 1 over time period. This is QB divided by 2 pi m. This is a linear frequency. If you are interested in the angular frequency, just multiply linear frequency with 2 pi, you get QB by m. If you revisit the expression for R, this is MV divided by QB. In this equation, instead of QB by m, I can write omega, then R equal to V divided by Omega. What is the importance of this uh, formula? Suppose you have a piece of material, like a piece of copper or piece of silicon. You want to find the properties of this material. The most fundamental thing you have to do is to identify the band structure of this material. So whether you want to study the electronic property, electrical property, transfer property, optical property, anything you need to first understand the band structure of the material. Maybe you are already familiar with at least some of the fundamental concepts in band structure. Maybe you would have heard there is a valence band, conduction band and an energy gap between these two and depending on the band structure you can classify materials into conductors, semiconductors, insulators, etc. Right? So probably you would have seen this kind of a parabolic band structure. But did you ever see closely what are the axes involved here? Right? This is a two dimensional graph, right? And I have two axes here. The y axis is the energy axis and uh, x axis is the k axis. K is the reciprocal lattice vector, which is related to momentum of the electron. So if you want to measure the band structure of a material, you have to measure energy of the electrons inside the material and also momentum of the electrons inside the material. Once you plot the graph between energy and momentum, you get the band structure. But it's difficult to go inside the material and measure the energy and momentum of the electron. Instead, what we do is somehow get the electron outside the material, then measure its energy and momentum. One of the methods is by using photoelectron spectroscope. Here what we do, a high energy radiation we shine on the material. Typically this is ultraviolet radiation or X-ray radiation. So here photons have very high energy. So because of uh, this high energy, the photon is able to knock out some of the electrons from the material. This is known as photoelectric effect. Maybe you would have already heard about this effect. So once the photoelectrons come out, you can measure its energy using an energy detector. So you get the kinetic energy. Now, suppose you want to measure the momentum. What you do? You have a cyclotron type of setup here. So there is a detector. Inside the detector, there is a constant magnetic field. And you make sure that the photoelectrons are incident on the detector perpendicular to the magnetic field. So this is the case we have discussed here. So we have uh, a magnetic force which will provide the centripetal acceleration required for the circular motion. So inside the detector, the electron is going to execute a circular motion. We won't take the full circle, we will take only the half circle. Now going back to this equation, we are talking about uh, electrons there, so charge of the electron is a constant. 
we have a constant magnetic field so this term is also constant so the only term which is going to vary is the radius r so more momentum if uh, higher is the momentum of the photoelectron larger is the radius of the circular path so by measuring the radius you can calculate what is the momentum of the photoelectron so that's what we do in photoelectron spectroscopy so you measure the radius of the photoelectron inside the detector and from this you can calculate the momentum so you have energy here momentum here plot these two you get the band structure once you have band structure you can calculate all the properties of the material similarly this kind of arrangement is also widely used in particle physics for example you want to accelerate particle you can use a cyclotron type of setup so when you accelerate the particle you are basically increasing the kinetic energy of the particle and at very high energies you make the particle collide with each other and from this collision there are new radiation new particle etc are generated using that you can study some of the fundamental properties of the the nucleus of uh, different types of atoms so even though the cyclotron equation is very simple and small its impact is really really huge so that's the classic case of the motion of a charged particle perpendicular to a magnetic field now let's take a more general case the charge q is traveling with velocity v at an arbitrary angle so we have seen in vector analysis moment you have an arbitrary direction you can resolve into two orthogonal components so you have a component parallel to the magnetic field call that as v parallel then a component perpendicular to the magnetic field call that as v perpendicular so you can write v equal to v parallel plus v perpendicular what is the magnetic force now q into v cross b which is q into v parallel cross b plus q into v perpendicular cross b cross product of two parallel vectors is zero so this term gets cancelled the force is q into v perpendicular cross b so this is the case we have discussed in the previous case right you have velocity component perpendicular to the magnetic field this leads to a circular motion so perpendicular component of the velocity provides a circular motion and the parallel component the parallel component is unaffected by the magnetic field so it continues to move along the linear direction so you have two types of motion here a circular motion provided by v perpendicular and a linear motion provided by v parallel so as a consequence of these two you get a helical motion so if the charged particle is traveling perpendicular to a uniform field you get a circular motion if it is traveling at an arbitrary angle you get a helical motion so that's about cyclotron motion in the next class we see what happens in addition to magnetic field if we also have an electric field how does the motion of the charged particle uh, change there okay so stay tuned for that thank you